All right. So thank you, Dr. Marin. Thank you, Dr. Davino. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Dr. Marin just indicated, I have kind of a different uh, background uh, than most folks. Um, and so after a very brief stint as a lawyer, um, I moved into the startup world. Uh, was the fourth employee at Advanced Health Corporation. 18 months after joining the company, we turned it into a public company. I figured this startup game can't be that hard if you can go from startup to public in 18 months. And so for the next 20 years, I tried to repeat that experience and uh, haven't quite gotten there yet, uh, but, but have been involved in the startup of a wide range of technology companies, starting out on the data management side of healthcare and increasingly moving towards uh, medical devices, uh, biotech companies. Uh, and at Ascent Biomedical Ventures, we currently have a portfolio of about 25 companies uh, that span the gamut. A third of those we founded from scratch, almost always in collaboration with an academic partner to get those going. And then I have had this parallel career in academia, uh, having had uh, academic positions at uh, Harvard Business School. I founded the Science and Economics program at Rockefeller University, where I taught for seven years. And I joined the faculty here at Mount Sinai uh, just about a year ago. Uh, because of my commercial uh, activities, I have a financial interest in a lot of different companies, uh, either as a co-founder, a venture capital investor, a board member, or a scientific advisory board member. So here at Sinai, we founded the Center for Technology Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and the idea was to focus on that green box there. Uh, so not so worried about pure basic research, although I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and how critical it is. Also not completely focused on uh, pure product development, which is the light blue box, but thinking about where those two uh, activities come together and how academic medical centers can participate in beginning to move research uh, to the, towards the uh, product outcome that we hope for. And so to this end, we've launched a new PhD program here that we call Design, Technology, and Entrepreneurship, which drives a combination of uh, traditional biology training uh, with engineering training and training in relevant social sciences such as finance, intellectual property, because all these disciplines are necessary to take an idea uh, or uh, early research all the way through to a product that can be delivered to the market. And so our goal for our graduates is to give them both technical expertise and practical experience to do this uh, as we move forward. And so we've actually enrolled the first students in the program uh, this fall and uh, have high hopes for it. When we think about these things, what we're really thinking about are big open medical problems. Um, and our goal is to use these large open problems to organize both our education but also technology development that we're thinking about working with the faculty on. And so to that end, what I think about when we go after these problems are project teams. Uh, academic medical centers tend to be very big on departments, very big on institutes, very big on lots of structures. Uh, but they tend to be less good about bringing together all the uh, multiple disciplines that you may need to move forward uh, a, a given technology. And so what we've tried to think about is how do you organize uh, a project, how you team around a given technology, uh, both with the people who may be inside Sinai, but who do we have to bring from outside Sinai to help move these things forward. Uh, and I think uh, we are going to begin to implement this here in the surgery department with a new innovation working group that Dr. Heron will be uh, hopefully announcing soon so that we can uh, engage some of you in these types of project teams. Um, so I do have an appointment as a full professor here, and so I have an academic interest. My interest is in how the economics of biomedical innovation work. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about public goods. I also am interested in the impact of networks and how we scale these various activities. Uh, but our question for today is this one. Should there be profit in scientific knowledge? And so to begin to answer this question, I'm going to tell you a story. And the story starts in 1930. So 1930 was kind of an interesting year. Mickey Mouse was published for the first time. Gandhi began his civil disobedience campaign in India. The first football World Cup was held in Uruguay. Pluto was discovered. I think it was a planet then. Uh, and President Hoover requested $150 million in an economic stimulus package to help bail out the country uh, shortly after declaring that prosperity would be just around the corner and that the Depression would only last 90 days. Against this backdrop, this somewhat formidable fellow, uh, Joseph Ranstall, was a Democratic senator from Louisiana. And he had been uh, engaged in a long-running political uh, battle. 
Throughout the early history of the United States, the prevailing doctrine of states' rights, together with its strain of general anti-elitism uh, uh, or populism, kept the nation from pursuing the vision of either Thomas Jefferson, who wanted the federal government to strongly support science through agriculture, or Alexander Hamilton, who advocated government subsidies for the advancement of technology to benefit industry. Um, having lost that battle, following World War I, scientists who had worked with the Chemical Warfare Service were seeking to establish a new institute in the private sector that would take the fundamental knowledge in chemistry that they had studied during the war and begin to apply it to medicine. So they spent eight years trying to raise money from philanthropists and industry partners and failed. And so despite the history of the federal government not funding uh, this type of work, they finally turned to Senator Ransdell in 1926, who was then the chairman of the Senate's Public Health Committee, and he asked, uh, or they asked Ransdell to introduce a bill to create a National Institute of Health. It took four years of active campaigning on Ransdell's part to eventually get this bill passed. And one of the main reasons it was passed is that the country had gone through an influenza crisis without a lot of ways to deal uh, with the challenges. And so finally the bill uh, got through Congress. And it did two things. It created the National Institute of Health. It was at that point just a single institute. And for the first time it provided uh, fellowships or funding for uh, basic scientific research. So this really marked a sea change in the attitude of the US political community and the US scientific community, beginning to look to the federal government as a source of funding for their work. The change in attitude was so swift and profound that when the National Cancer Institute Act came up for a vote in 1937, it passed both houses of Congress unanimously. So you have to remember, this is the middle of the Depression. You're coming to ask for money. The government is financially strapped. But the private market has failed. You've failed to raise philanthropic money. You've failed to get industry to give you any money. And so you ask the government for $15 million. Unfortunately, the history of this is that scientists were in a position to complain about the government under-allocating resources to them right from the beginning, because although they did get money, they only got $750,000. So we're going to pause in our story now and uh, move into economics. Maybe you may have gone to medical school to avoid economics, but hopefully some of you remember some of this. So economics is often thought as the study of the allocation of scarce resources amongst people. It provides an explanation for which goods and services wind up in the hands of which people. And someone here, somewhere in here is a joke about uh, always good to have an animal model when you're speaking to clinicians and scientists. But when we think about economics, what we're really thinking about is this question of how do we allocate goods. And so there are a bunch of ways that you can allocate. You can steal, you can beg, you can borrow, you can gamble. But the two most common ways that we allocate goods are either through a central government system, as espoused by Marx, or through the allocation by free markets, as advocated by Adam Smith. And history to this point has favored the butchers and the bakers that form the invisible hand of the market as really the superior system for figuring out how we ought to allocate resources. And so the free hand of the market works through the dynamics of supply and demand, seeking an equilibrium point. So you have price, you have quantity, you have demand, and for a given price and a given quantity, you're hoping that the demand and the supply balance. If there's too much surplus, you'll get downward pressure on the price, if, and if there's shortage, you'll get upward pressure on the price. And it's this uh, price uh, as the signal for the value of a commodity that really is the secret of the invisible hand. Price is the critical uh, factor that allows us to um, determine uh, how much to make and how much to acquire of a given uh, commodity. But when we look at this across a market, we have to figure out what the de market demand is going to be rather than a simple single person demand. And so to do that, we calculate something called the horizontal sum. So again, if we have a quantity and a price in a two person market, you would sum Q1 and Q2 and that would give you your market demand. And the reason that this works this way is that goods in general have two characteristics. They're exclusive. Once you buy a good, you own it. You consume it as you please, but it means that somebody else can't use it. And secondarily, it's rival. Once I take it off the shelf, you can't take it off the shelf. And that's why we have to sum our quantities horizontally, because we have to create more in order to satisfy demand if there is increased demand. 
So there's a lot we could talk about in regards to efficiency of markets and these sorts of things, but for the moment, the main thing that you need to remember is, as my children would say, that when it comes to allocating goods, markets rule. The problem is, when you go to law school, you learn a lot about exceptions, and in this case, there actually is an exception. And an exception is that there's a different category of goods that challenge this neat formula of market equilibrium being set by simple supply and demand curves. And here are some examples of these goods. So clean air, national defense, and music melody, public parks, what have you. And the most famous example of this is the lighthouse. There's a well-known economist named Ronald Coase, and he tells this story. He's a sailor, and he keeps sailing by the rocky shore, and he keeps hitting the rocks and sinking his boat. Turns out his neighbor is a sailor, too, so he goes to his neighbor and says, hey, let's build a lighthouse. And she says, sure, I've been sinking my boats, too, and so they build the lighthouse. And then Dr. Marin's boat sails by, and Dr. DeVino's boat sails by, and although they didn't pay for the lighthouse, they take advantage of the light, and their boats don't sink. However, we paid for the lighthouse, and so something seems a little bit out of whack there. And the problem is that the light has two characteristics. It's actually non-rival, right? We don't use up the light. We could all use the light, and it's still there, and it's non-exclusive. I can't stop you from getting access to it. And so goods that have these two characteristics, non-rivalry and non-excludability, are called by economists public goods. And so you can chart these things out in a simple two-by-two two matrix based on these two characteristics of rivalry and excludability. And so private goods work in that nice simple supply and demand uh, basis that we think of typically in economics. But public goods don't because they have non-rivalry and non uh, uh, excludability is, is part and parcel of what they are, and so scientific knowledge, along with the lighthouse, is a very canonical example of what we think of as a public good in economics. And here, prices fail. Prices don't act uh, to give us the signal that we're looking for. So again, if we have a simple market where a actor is willing to, for a quantity of one, pay three, and maybe there's a second actor in the market who's willing to pay four, are we going to get our quantity of demand by summing horizontally? The answer, of course, is no, because for the public good, our light, it doesn't get used up. So I don't have to sum across because I'm not using up. Once I've created the light, I've created the light. And so I have to sum vertically. And the problem with this is that you may get an outcome that you're not looking for. So let's say for a given good that we determine that the optimal amount of that good is something just more than two. So that would be our equilibrium point there at four. But at that price, our first act in the market is actually not willing to pay anything, is unwilling to participate. And our other actor in the market is actually only willing to pay for one. And so we have a gap. And this gap we call a market failure, and it's the uh, standard market failure that happens for public goods. We fail because of the uh, failure of, of, good, of these goods to act in uh, response to pricing uh, indicators uh, to fund them at the rate that we might deem socially optimal. There are other problems with public goods. If you are a buyer of a car or a coal, or pretty much any good, you want to know something about that good when you buy it. If the deal falls through, the deal falls through, and you move on to buy the commodity somewhere else. But in the case of knowledge, in the case of information, you have a problem, which is if I go to buy a piece of information from Dr. Marin, I want to know something about that information. If he reveals too much to me about the information and our deal falls through, I'm out of luck. He's got all the knowledge. Alternatively, he may not tell me enough about the information, and I can't determine whether I really care, and so I undervalue it, and I don't make him a, a good offer, and he doesn't complete the transaction. So in economics, we talk about transactional spillover. How much information spills over or isn't accounted for in the transaction? For public goods, it's a huge issue, because if you have all the information, you tend not to price it at the rate that uh, perhaps it should be worth in the market. And we have one final problem with public goods, and that's this notion of free riders. So if Merck funds basic research and then goes out and publishes its results, and Pfizer doesn't do any basic research but reads all of Merck's results and then uses those results to go make technology and then sells that technology in the market, Merck, uh, Pfizer's uh, margin is going to be better 
because they didn't have to spend the money to do the basic research. Merck watches this for a while, realizes it's making less money because it's investing in this basic knowledge that's being shared, and so they stop doing it. So once again, we have a market failure. The market won't produce the basic research at a level, at a rate that we need to continue to move our uh, scientific enterprise forward. And this problem is known as the free rider problem. It's like my people in the boats who didn't pay for my lighthouse. They're free riding on the investment that I made in my lighthouse. And the really big challenge with free riding is that as your community grows larger, the free rider problem grows larger. If the three of us are in a little group and we want to build our lighthouse, and I say, will you chip in? And you say yes, and you say no. We use some dirty words about this fellow. If we're all in the group, and I ask all of you to pitch in, and he free rides on us, he kind of gets lost in the noise. We don't notice him so much. So the bigger your organization is, the easier it is to be a free rider. The more of you who don't wash your hands because you just figure some you know, won't be a problem, the bigger the problem becomes. It has to um, uh, become apparent to you in your, in your group that your lack of action has some impact. Of course, the other problem is as your, society, as your group gets bigger, you need more of whatever the public good is. So you need more of those hand sanitizers, the more of you that there are to use them. So it's actually a classic public good problem. So the conclusion of all this is that if we're going to uh, think about allocating public goods, we don't get to use the vernacular, they just fail. So what do we do about that? We might have to have some sort of a solution, and we do. What we do is we tax you, and we take the, the uh, tax revenue and we create a subsidy, and we call the subsidy the National Institutes of Health. It's a tax-driven subsidy to create more basic research because we don't think that the industry or the philanthropy is producing enough of this good. And then we have another way to uh, address this problem, and that is that we're going to convert your public good into a private good. We're going to take your scientific knowledge and we're going to put it into the form of a patent. And by creating it in the form of a patent, you take what is non-rival and non-excludable and turn it into something that is rival and excludable, and now it'll work in a market. We can trade it. We can talk to somebody and give them enough information to have them value your asset correctly so that you can think about it in the way you would as, as a private good. So this is a second way that we can solve the challenge of public goods and get the market to function efficiently. All right, so that's enough economics. Let's go back to our story. Um, in the period following World War II, science entered a kind of golden period. We had new medicines such as penicillin. We had technology such as radar, sonar, synthetic rubber. We began to take trips to outer space. Um, it was kind of an inspiring time, both for science fiction writers and for young minds who were excited about science. And the government at this point continued to provide funding uh, for scientific uh, endeavors, largely due to the work of this fellow, Vannevar Bush. Bush is an interesting guy. He was the dean of the School of Engineering at MIT. He was the founder of Raytheon. He was the president of the Carnegie Institute. And then during World War II and immediately following the war, he was the first presidential science advisor. And he writes this report in 1945 as we begin to come out of the war where he basically argues that we needed a social contract and that the social contract was that the U.S. public would fund science in universities. Universities would train the next group of scientists and would distribute that information that they created through their efforts out into the world as a public good. And so this fellow, Robert Merton, who is an uh, influential sociologist, was watching this all uh, go along, and he wrote this uh, paper called The Normative Structure of Science, and he came up with this little acronym of KUDOS. And what he wrote about was that the scientific community was about communalism, meaning that the scientific results are the common property of the community, that the scientific community was universal, that it didn't matter what your race, nationality, culture, gender, orientation were, that you should be able to compete based on merit that you ought to be disinterested, that you should present your results untangled with your personal beliefs or activism for a given cause, that your research should be novel and additive to our knowledge base, and that you should be skeptical, that you should look at scientific claims and uh, expose them to critical scrutiny before accepting them. And when you put these two things together, Bush's belief that we should fund science as a public good, and Merton's description of this um, almost altruistic uh, belief in science, you come up with this highly idealized republic of science. This was a phrase that was coined by a noted science writer named Michael Polanyi. 
And in his Endless Frontier report, Bush lauded the support for this uh, republic by noting the following, that science, when put to practical use, means more jobs, higher wages, shorter hours, more abundant crops, more leisure for recreation, for study, for learning how to live without the deadening drudgery which had been the burden of common man for ages past. So I think that's pretty good. If you're going to try to convince somebody they ought to support uh, science, it's pretty good to convince them that you can do away with deadening drudgery. So if we move ahead then to 1980, the US had severed its diplomatic ties with Iran as the hostage crisis dragged on. We have another president bailing somebody out. This is Jimmy Carter signing a $1.5 billion loan guarantee to save the Chrysler Corporation. The US hockey team won the miracle on ice. The empire struck back. And Ronald Reagan was elected, ushering the Democrats out of power. So this is 50 years after Rand still first got the federal government to fund uh, scientific research. And in that time, our $750,000 allocation to funding had grown to $3 billion. Every year during this period, government funding of research and development outstripped industry funding. So for 50 years, every year, the government spent more on R&D than private industry did. And the government owned over 30,000 patents that came out of this funding. So our Republic of Science seemed pretty strong at this point. It seemed like we had struck a pretty good social contract. But there was some trouble. The prevailing philosophy at this time was that the government was paying for the scientific work unless the government or the taxpayer therefore should own it. Therefore, there were 30,000 patents sitting on a shelf somewhere because the government couldn't quite figure out how to commercialize those patents. And so only 5% of these federally funded patents were actually commercially licensed. The other thing, of course, that's happening in 1980 is that Japan is beginning to be uh, ascendant. We are very concerned about our economic status in the world. And people began to agitate that we needed to do something to regain our competitive um, uh, stance in the world. But the problem was that our scientific uh, community was producing public goods. We were taking that uh, money from the government. We were doing the science. We were publishing it openly. The government was then sitting on the patents. We weren't creating private benefit from all of this activity. And this really shouldn't come as a lot of uh, surprise, because we've just reviewed the fact that public goods don't work in markets. So we needed a solution. And the solution that came about was a massive effort by the government to privatize the public good of scientific research. And they did this uh, in a number of different ways, not all of which we're going to touch on. But perhaps the most influential piece of this privatization movement was known as the University and Small Business Patent Procedure Act, colloquially known as the Bayh-Dole Act. And as you all probably know, this is the act that says if you're a university and you take federal money and you produce intellectual property and you license it to the commercial world, you, the university, holds on to the benefit of that. So you suddenly have introduced to the university a reason, a commercial reason, a market reason, to go and commercialize their technology. Now, interestingly, most people don't bother to go back and read the objectives of the act. When you look at what's called legislative history, the history of how the law came about, there's usually a whole bunch of commentary about what the people who are trying to get the law passed were thinking. And in this case, there's a very specific comment in uh, the legislative history that says that the explicit purpose of the act was to promote collaboration between commercial concerns and nonprofit organizations, including universities. The government explicitly was setting out to say that academia and industry need to work together and that we're going to use this mechanism to do just that. Interestingly, through a little quirk in history, right at this same time, the Supreme Court passed a really important case. Up until this time, uh, anything that was living was not patentable. Uh, this fellow, Chakrabarty, was an engineer at GE. He invented a bacterium that could break down crude oil. And he said, hey, this would be great if I could put this bacteria out into an oil spill and clean it up. And he filed a patent. And the patent office rejected it, saying, no, the bacteria is living. We can't patent that. So this case then wound up and down through the courts for a long period of time, finally ending up at the Supreme Court, where they ruled that, quote, the relevant distinction in patentability is not between living and inanimate things, but whether living products could be seen as human-made inventions. In a very close 5-4 ruling, they determined that they could. And this unleashed a flood of patents on microbes, plants, animals, cells, cell lines, genes, um, and altered and created uh, the biotech industry. 
And so this set of activities thus creates a bright line in thinking about how we go about commercializing technology. Because the government had decided that the public good was nice and they should continue to fund it, but we needed a mechanism to turn it then into something that we could privatize and use uh, in the commercial marketplace. So you can think of this as a regime of technology which was plop, plopped down in the midst of this republic of science. And it was this specific response to the failure of the market to capitalize on scientific knowledge while it was codified purely in the form of a public good, we had to create these barriers, patents and other things that allowed us to treat them as private goods. So where are we today? We still have conflict in the Middle East. U.S. Pres presidents continue to sign bills providing stimulus to ailing economies and bailing out major U.S. automobile companies. And political parties continue to be ushered in and out of office, proving that while political change is commonplace, actual change is somewhat more difficult to achieve. And we have an ongoing tug of war. So in our Republic of Science, in the post-World War II uh, view, technology spawning is all driven by the ease of access to scientific information. Uh, access drives invention because it reduces the cost and increases the number of people available to work on a given piece of scientific knowledge. This is that Mertonian notion of openness and sharing. But of course, this is uh, put in contrast to control, the post-1980 view, that actually the way to get technology spawned from basic research is to, is to create an ability to control uh, the, the knowledge. Invention requires a lot of investment, and it's only by creating a way to get a uh, clear return on that investment that you're going to get uh, the private markets to act. And so although different, these two perspectives are not inherently contradictory. Ease of access might decrease the cost of invention, but at the same time, control over the knowledge produced can certainly encourage investment in this costly process. What is potentially uh, in, in distinction between these two views, though, is what uh, type of organization is best footed to encourage the creation of more technology. And so those emphasizing access think that universities are the best place to encourage science-based invention. Not only is the diffusion of knowledge from academic labs a consequence of the educational mission of the university, it's also the result of these norms that Merton set out. It's part and parcel of the scientific endeavor. And in theory, that openness and sharing of new ideas should create uh, more and more technology. Uh, those who argue on the control side say, no, 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 that's all nonsense. Industry scientists have this clear economic imperative to make money off of developing technology, and they get the resources to do it, and so that's the better environment in which to spawn new technologies. And so you can actually make a pretty good case for uh, the control end of the spectrum. So in the 20 years following this sea change in 1980, you see a 10 times increase in the number of academic patents uh, filed, a 20 times increase in life sciences patents filed out of academia. You see a, a huge number of new companies being founded, a large proportion of which are still in operation. And in 2003 alone, you saw over 500 new products coming out of university research introduced to the market. So that's a pretty good case that the government did something right in trying to privatize this market. On the other hand, if you're more an open access kind of person, you can actually make an argument that there are some signs that things aren't so great. Um, there are a whole series of papers published that show the uh, reaching in of industry to the open publication process in a way that maybe is not so healthy. And so in a science world driven almost entirely by applied outcomes and control rights through patents, secrecy becomes a necessary precursor to the filing of patents, and it can lead to a bunch of socially unappealing outcomes, right? We don't actually like uh, monopolies as economists. We talk about the deadweight burden of a monopoly, and what a patent gives you, at least for a defined period of time, is the monopoly around whatever your uh, disclosure is. And so that is something that generally we don't like, but it's the only way we've come up to effectively solve this problem of the public good. And you've seen this play out on the papers if you follow the Myriad Genetics case. Right? It's a great example where university research made a very fundamental uh, discovery. It was patented and then turned into a commercial opportunity, and there have been a lot of debate on both sides about what the best way to handle that is, what's the best thing for patients. Um, so whichever side of these two uh, poles, the access pole and the control pole, you want to sit on, the reality is to move things ahead, you need to fund research and technology somehow. And so what's interesting about this chart is that roughly around 1980, you see a shift where R&D begins to 
increase out of private industry. So the private industry for that long period uh, underspent compared to the federal government now begins to overspend compared to the federal government in terms of R&D spending. And so control advocates correlate this with the government's move to promote the privatization of scientific knowledge. But access advocates have their argument too. And this is their alternative explanation for the rise of private R&D funding beginning in the 1980s. What they argue is that this ongoing trend of increased private investment is a result of spillover knowledge generated and made freely accessible by the Republic of Science. So what they say is that by creating more shared basic scientific knowledge, we reduce the uncertainty of, R of applied R&D. As we reduce the uncertainty, we lower the risk. As we lower the risk, the rates of return for R&D investment go up. And while the rates go up, they increase further investment in the area. And so, in fact, this increase has nothing to do with control. It has everything to do with the decision the government made in 1930 correctly, which was to begin to fund and create this public good. So the other thing that happens in 1980 is suddenly somebody decides that innovation is something we should start thinking about or at least writing about, right? So we see this massive increase in the number of papers on innovation. And um, I, I kind of hate the word, because it's like a lot of these buzzwords. You know, if you work in venture capital and industry, you get really good at saying things like, well, you know, you need to have an out-of-the-box business plan that leverages your big data to be truly disruptive, so bring to the table something that we can invest in. You know, I hate that. And I sort of feel like that's what's happened with innovation. It's become this buzzword that almost doesn't mean anything. But the reality is that it is important. And we need to think about it because there are a vast number of unmet needs that are in search of innovative solutions. And it was fascinating for me to sit here and hear the case about the fish drill this morning. We actually have invested in a company that came out of Stanford uh, that has a product to treat anorectal fistulas. I have to say, when that one comes into the office, you look around and hope that somebody else is the one to get assigned that one. Um, but still and all, it's a big unmet need. And it needs an innovative solution, it sounds like. It sounds like the rates of treatment are uh, not where you want them to be. It sounds like it takes a huge amount of time and effort amongst the physicians to deal with. And so how do we get at this? How do we begin to think about needs and risks? What are we going to do about these unmet needs? And so you can begin to create these heuristics. You can begin to think about problems and where they fit in the relative position in a cascade of needs. Right? You can s figure out the fistula, how to treat it once it's there. Or you can move upstream. How can we stop it from ever happening in the first place? And the fistula sounds like it's a complication. So maybe the thing we really should think about is why is the patient here at all? Maybe we can avoid even having them enter the hospital. And so that moves you out here into that blue sky need zone, which is great because you need to invent new technology and the returns may be super high. Of course, your risk of failure is much, much higher. And so maybe you move back downstream and you say, really, let's just focus on the fistula and how to do it better. Somewhat more incremental, but maybe somewhat more addressable. And so you're beginning to think about what the needs are and what the risks are as you put your time into that, and as you think about innovative solutions, as you think about, is this a problem that I want to try to be get, begin to get involved in? And so as you begin to worry about this, what you want to be thinking about is what is going to be a successful innovation. Is it going to be incremental? Is it going to be disruptive? Regardless, you have to solve a certain equation. You have to figure out what users want. You have to figure out what your given technology can do. And then you have to think about what the commercial marketplace is going to deem economically viable so that your solution actually can matter and get distributed more broadly. Uh, which brings me to entrepreneurship. You know, most of the time when people talk about entrepreneurship, what they're talking about is starting a new company. And I'm all in favor of that. I've done a lot of that. But that actually is not what entrepreneurship is about. What I think entrepreneurship is about is thinking about and recognizing and figuring out how to exploit an opportunity. And so I have a definition of uh, entrepreneurship that I really like. It's by a Harvard Business School professor named Howard Stevenson. He says that entrepreneurship is the process by which individuals, either on their own or inside organizations, pursue opportunities without regard to the resources currently controlled. And that's the trick. You have to begin to think about that need and how you're going to solve it without getting all hung up on the resources. People often come to me and say, I have this idea and I, you know, I need to start a company to get at it. Maybe. I can start a company for you in literally 10 minutes. We can go to a computer. We can do it right here. Creating a paper company is simple. Figuring out whether or not you've come up with a good solution to a need that really is unmet and that really could be supported in the market, that's hard. And figuring out how to do that without controlling all the resources necessary to get at it, 
That's being an entrepreneur. And I will tell you that I've actually been surprised in my short time here at Sinai about just how entrepreneurial the organization is. And you have a great examples in your leadership here, including Dr. Marin, who can tell you super stories about how he went out and was very entrepreneurial. Worked without a lot of resources, but figured out how to get a product created, tested in humans, and, treat, and out onto the market to treat more people. And that's part and parcel of what I want to do here, and that's what I would like to help the surgery department do here, is for those of you for whom this is an interest, for those of you who have ideas about new devices or new techniques or new ways to get at these unmet needs, we need to come up with a way to do that effectively for you within the bounds of your life, which is busy and overtaxed as it is. So in conclusion, I'm going to leave you with this thought. Over the long run, fundamental knowledge and practical techniques developed in the pursuit of basic science serve to keep the applied R&D business profitable. It's the government's responsibility to fund those public goods that industry and the private market won't. We want the NIH. We want to use those tax dollars to create these public goods. But it's our responsibility as members of the biomedical establishment to act entrepreneurially to go out and recognize the unmet needs and to seek innovative solutions to them. If we can then create solutions, we can leverage the spillover knowledge coming from that government investment in research, and we will create profit for ourselves, for our institution, and we can use that profit then to reinvest to treat the next set of unmet needs. Thank you very much.